Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by the last man standing with Loserpool.com. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simeon, and I'm recording on this bank holiday Easter Monday. Uh, I want to start off by wishing you all a happy Easter. I hope you all had a great time with your families and friends, had plenty of food, plenty of drink, and enjoyed the lovely weather here in London. On this show, I'll be riding solo and I will be dissecting that very, very disappointing defeat at the Emirates Stadium at the hands of Crystal Palace. Arsenal uh, failing to take the opportunity that was presented to us to leapfrog Spurs and go up into third place uh, ahead of our trip to Molyneux on Wednesday night. I think there's only one place to start and it's got to be uh, with the manager. Let's take a look at his initial team selection. Bernd Leno returned in between the sticks. It was a back three of Shkodran, Mustafi, Lauren Koscielny and Konstantinos Mavrobanos. And then the wing backs were Ser Kalasinac and Carl Jenkinson, to many people's surprise. A midfield a duo of Matteo Guendouzi and Mohamed Elneny with Mesut Ozil in front of them. And then, of course, uh, Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang and Alexander Lacazette were leading the line now. Initial thoughts on the team selection, and I tweeted this as soon as the team came out. So this is not one of those cases where I've just, you know, decided after the game that Unai Emery made a mistake. I said as soon as I saw the team that I was fearful of the lack of quality that Arsenal had in the middle of the park. And my example uh, to base that theory on was the game at Everton a couple of weeks ago where, you know, we went there. We didn't have any quality in the midfield. We were unable to retain possession. We were unable to do anything when we did have possession, we were unable to play in between the lines, create uh, anything of note. And then, you know, somebody like Mesut Ozil, whose speciality is popping up in the pockets, receiving the ball uh, quickly to his feet, isn't getting that kind of service. The strikers were starved of service too. Even Kolasinac was bombing up and down the left-hand side and the passes out to him were just that fraction too late, meaning that he was always marked and Juan Bissaka was always able to get out there and Kolasinac wasn't as effective. He kept having to turn back, uh, play it inside, which is not his strength. You know, we've seen Sey Kolasinac time and time again this season bomb down that left flank, beat his man and cut balls across and create a ton of chances for this Arsenal side. Now, people will probably argue that Unai Emery had to rotate. He had to rest players. Um, Lucas Torreira, uh, according to most of you, was not fully fit, not fit enough to play for 90 minutes. Well, if that's the case then you start him for me. Um, you know, Arsenal, as as far as I'm concerned, have three decent central midfield players. Lucas Torreira is one of them. Granit Xhaka is the second. And the third is Aaron Ramsey. Now, two of them were out injured. You cannot afford to leave the third one out on the bench. Crystal Palace's away form is fantastic this season. It's really, really good. They've obviously proven that they're stronger on the road than they are at Selhurst Park. They've picked up some brilliant results on their travels this season, which makes it even more silly that Unai Emery was so naive and so complacent about this fixture. So complacent that he felt he could bring in uh, you know, Mavropanos, who for me was poor at Watford, that he could bring in um, Carl Jenkinson, that he could get away with playing that midfield duo, or as a, a friend was on, on Twitter, calls him the hair bear bunch in the middle of the park because they're not good enough. They're just simply not good enough. And I know that Matteo Guendouzi is a young player and he's a prospect and I get that. And I've always said that throughout the season, this guy has the potential to become a very, very good player, but he's got a hell of a lot to learn, a hell of a lot to learn. He's nowhere near where he needs to be. He's not at the level where he can be playing for Arsenal week in, week out and where he can be relied upon. For me, as a manager, if you rely on a player like that, it will go it will go against you, it will blow up in your face, and, and you'll be left with egg on your face at the end of the day. You'll look silly because he's not good enough. And as for Mohamed Elneny, well, we, we've always known that he's not good enough. He's nothing more than a squad player. I, this might be controversial. I said it in the past. Mohamed Elneny was brought in to sell shirts in a certain part of the world. He wasn't brought in because anybody believed that he would be uh, a top player, you know, maybe Arsene Wenger did, but it was very clear very early on in his Arsenal career that this guy wasn't good enough and he was average at best. So to go into this game with that midfield made no sense to me. If Torreira's only fit for 45 minutes, start the game, give it everything, get your foothold in the game. I'm not, you don't even have to be necessarily winning the game, but be in control of the game. And then if you see that he's struggling, you take him off. 
it's not rocket science. I, you know, Unai Emery got it wrong. And, and if we're going to sit there and praise him every time he impacts games at half time with his substitutions and stuff, which is fair, then we need to be fair the other way. And we need to acknowledge when he's made a mistake. And in my opinion, and I think in most people's opinions this week, he made a fatal mistake. A mistake that ultimately, combined with Mustafi's bullshit, which I'll come on to in a minute, cost us the game. In regards to the midfield, another option may have been to bring Ainsley Maitland-Niles in there um, and put him alongside one of those two. Now, you know, we know he's composed on the ball. We know he's very confident. We know he's had a lot of minutes this season, um, you know, since Hector Bellerin got injured in particular. So for me, that would have been a, a, another possibility, another option that Unai Emery could have explored. In, you know, we always talk about Ainsley Maitland-Niles and we say he's not a right back. You know, he's a great player. He's not a right back. It's not his position. He's a central midfielder. Well, yesterday was the prime opportunity to give him, uh, you know, a chance to show what he can do in that position. And for me, he couldn't have done any worse than those two. Um, you know, we couldn't retain possession. The, the passing was sideways. They were unable to do anything ambitious. I felt like Guendouzi in particular overplayed at times. He needs three, four, sometimes even five touches before he releases the ball. And at this level, when a team come and sit and park the bus in front of you, you need to be moving the ball quicker. That's how you unlock teams. You don't unlock teams by taking four or five touches, turning to your colleague and playing the pass sideways. So for me, you know, and I know a lot of people are going to say that El Nenny was as bad, and I agree. Yeah, he was bad as well. But for me, Guendouzi was worse. Because with Guendouzi, it's not just what he does on the ball that winds me up. It's what he does on the football pitch in general. He's like a petulant little kid. He w runs around the pitch. He appeals for everything, and that's fine. But when it doesn't get given his way, he throws his toys out the pram. And for me, his attitude at times is disgusting. If he spent as much time, um, you know, on his positional sense as he does complaining, getting in the referee's faces, getting involved with other players, he'll be a lot better player. So for me, that that is the frustration with Matteo Genduzzi. And then right at the end of the game, there was a cross that came into the box and Genduzzi was challenging for it. And he went down um, after a tangle with a couple of Palace defenders. And you just think... Whilst it's probably a marginal call, I haven't seen it back because it wasn't shown on match of the day. Um, you know, you'd probably say it's a marginal call. It probably isn't a penalty. But when they are marginal calls like that, if you've been at it all game, throwing yourself on the floor, rolling around, getting in people's faces, arguing with the referee, he's not going to rule in your favour. It's not going to happen. And and that is a problem of Matteo Genduzzi's own doing. He doesn't need to get involved in half the shit he gets involved in. He needs to concentrate on his game. He's 19 years old. He needs to focus on his development. Nothing else. That's it. All right, let's move on to the man that you've all been waiting for me to rant about. And it's Shkodran Mustafi. Um, where do I begin? Where do I begin with this guy who consistently costs us, consistently makes errors that lead to goals, consistently switches off, loses his concentration and quite frankly isn't good enough to play for this football club. It's one of those things that, you know, it's really frustrating because there are weeks, there are weeks where Shkodran Mustafi turns up and plays brilliantly. I thought he was really good at Watford. I thought he was really good at Spurs earlier on in the season at right back and I know he ended up conceding the penalty but, you know, it shouldn't have been a penalty because Harry Kane was offside. So I don't sit there and say that Shkodran Mustafi cost us that that point, uh, that two points, because in my opinion, the referee got that wrong and the referee needs to take responsibility for that. But overall that day, his performance was good. It was solid. It was, you know, he'd done his job. He was sharp. He was in there. He was winning challenges. He was positionally good, very disciplined. And then he has games like yesterday. And you just think to yourself... Where's this guy's head at? I mean, particularly for me, I mean, the first goal, let's look at the first goal, the cross came in and Benteke completely stole a march on him, free in the penalty area, completely free header. And that was shocking defending from Shkod Ram Mustafi, in my opinion, and the rest of the defence. To allow a striker to have that much space in the middle of your penalty area, completely unchallenged, is criminal. And then to stand there putting your arms up, I know he's trying and to get, you know, a decision and trying to get himself out of deep water, but... That was poor. But forget about that one. It was poor defending. It happens. 
we got over it. We started the second half. Finally, Unai Emery woke up, made the changes. Although for me, um, he still didn't change the problematic area in our team, which was the centre of midfield. He did bring on Alex Iwobi, who had a brilliant impact when he came on. He was energetic. He was uh, quick in everything he did, sharp. He was linking up brilliantly with Mesut Ozil. And all of a sudden, you saw Mesut Ozil come to life because there was a player on the pitch that was busy, that was moving about, that was, you know, helping him, that was picking him out in those pockets, that was coming over and pulling defenders away from him. And there was some brilliant combination play. Alex Lacazette, lovely reverse pass. Mesut Ozil, fantastic finish. That thing where he kicks the ball into the ground. I don't know what to call it other than the Mesut Ozil, but fantastic finish. Completely fooled Gaeta in the Palace goal. Arsenal were level and had the bit between our teeth. And then Shkodra Mustafi pops up with one of his moments where he's completely fallen asleep. It's a route one ball. It's a flick on, I think, from Benteke. Um you know, towards Zaha and Mustafi, I don't know what he's doing. I don't know if he thinks that Bernd Leno's going to come and collect it. But then if he is thinking that, he's obviously not realised where he is on the pitch. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what he's thinking. He's appealing for a foul. There was no such thing in the in the build-up to that goal. He turns around and kind of looks at Bernd Leno as if to say, mate, why didn't you come and get it? Well, for me, it's it's... Simply not good enough. The blame lays at the feet of Shkodran Mustafi here. And he's done it time and time and time again. And I think there are many Arsenal fans out there this week who will be done with Shkodran Mustafi now. That's it. No more chances. Um, but the reality is that if we're going to achieve our goals this season, Shkodran Mustafi is going to play a part in that. Whether you like it or not, I don't believe that Unai Emery is just going to shove him out of the team. He may be looking to the summer and thinking, you know, this guy can't be here next summer. This guy's not going to feature in my plans. But for the time being, we're kind of stuck with the guy. So to go on social media and bash him and send him tweets personally and comment on his Instagram for me is not helpful. Just as booing at half time and at the end of the game is not helpful. Um, so, you know, I think it's a bit of, um, what's the word? It's something that our fans need to tidy up on. Our behavior towards certain players you know, yeah, it's justified. It's, you're absolutely right to be disappointed with Shkodran Mustafi's performance. You're absolutely right to be pissed off at the team's performance and at the manager's uh, decisions yesterday. But to boo them or to send them personal abuse on social media, how is that helpful? I don't think it is personally. Um, nothing wrong with voicing your opinions, of course, but there's a way of doing it, isn't there? There's a way of going about things like that. I haven't even mentioned Shkodran's uh, booking that he received in the second half for diving in his own half. So, you know, that just that alone shows you what kind of day he was having. Um, I want to talk about some other points as well. Um, I've already spoken about uh, the midfield. I've spoken about Genduzi. I've spoken about El Nenny. We've spoken about um, the team selection overall, but there's a few more players that I want to touch on, a few more selection issues that I want to raise. And, and the first one is... Um, Costandinos Mavrobanos. Now, I'm Greek, as many of you will know. I'm from a Greek background. So nothing pleases me more, makes me more proud than to see Greek players representing Arsenal, of course. However, this guy has been out in the wilderness for the entire season. The entire season. Last season, he played twice, I think. Uh, the games that come to mind, Manchester United away, Leicester away, got sent off in the Leicester game. He's been out for the entire season, few Europa League appearances here and there. But to throw him in at Watford the other night was crazy, in my opinion. He looked rusty, he looked awful, he was taken off early doors. And then he starts yesterday against Crystal Palace, against the likes of Wilfred Zaha, Christian Benteke. Um, and I think to myself, why? Why would you put him in the firing line I thought he was shaky at the beginning he picked up a yellow card after that he seemed to grow into the game a little bit but for me play with a back four play with a back four where you know you know the players are ready to play you know it's tried and tested you have that extra man in midfield you could have put an extra player in there to assist Elneny Genduzi in there because they were completely overrun um, completely incapable of making us tick you could have even even stuck an Alex Iwobi or a Henrik Mkhitaryan in there if you had 
that extra insurance policy of having that extra midfield player just to move the ball a little bit better. M- Mkhitaryan, probably the best shout there. So, you know, if, of course, assuming you really don't want to start Lucas Torreira or, or have him feature. So that's just another option that Unai could have explored. He's, he seems to be stuck on this back three now. But then he changes it mid-game over and over again. We start with a back three, we end up with a back four, then we go back to a back three. It's just an absolute fucking mess. It's a mess. And I'm sure that the players are finding it difficult during the game to keep switching up. You know who you're marking, you know what space you're covering, and then Unai tells you to change formation. And then all of a sudden, you're in two minds. Am I picking up Zaha? Am I picking up Benteke? What happens if... The, the fullback gets forward? What happens if the left uh, midfielder gets forward? Who's picking him up? For me, it's all too confusing. And as Alan O'Brien said on last week's show, or the last show, sorry, after the Napoli game, whereas where there have been times where the, the formation changes and the adjustments have helped, there have been times where they've hindered us too. And at times, we're guilty of tinkering a little bit too much. And for me, I would have played a back four from the start yesterday, um, had that extra man in midfield and I know hindsight is a wonderful thing but you're asking a young kid a centre half with jack shit experience let's be honest who's been out for a long time who's lacking in fitness to come in the team for the most crucial part of the season and have an impact it ain't gonna happen um, and for me the longer he stays in the team the more problems we're gonna have and I, I, I want to be clear I'm not blaming him for the defeat yesterday but it's clear to me that he's Another one who's not ready to make that step up just yet. He's not even hardly played for the under-23s and all of a sudden he's in the first team mix. And then you've got Carl Jenkinson. And one thing that really, really, really winds me up as an Arsenal fan is when I hear people say, Oh, I love Carl Jenkinson. What do you love about Carl Jenkinson? What do you love about him? That he's an Arsenal fan? Because that's as far as it goes. Ability-wise, he's shocking. He can't stay fit. He's a liability He's the only thing in Carl Jenkinson's favour is he's an athlete and he gets up and down the pitch. But his positional sense is shocking. His technical ability is poor and he's not good enough to play for this football club. He's only there because we can't shift him off this ridiculous contract that he was handed by the previous regime. Carl Jenkinson has got to go. Then you've got Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang and we had a question on the last show about Aubameyang and my response was, Yes, he could do more in games, but you look at his goal record and then you kind of say to yourself, well, I can't really criticise him today. And that's exactly what happened again this week. He scored. But for me, he doesn't do enough. He's static. He works at a half pace when he's not on the ball. And in comparison to Alexander Lacazette, they're like chalk and cheese. Lacazette is always pressing, hassling, trying to make things happen, receiving the ball with his back to goal, looking to spin, turn, bring others into the game. Aubameyang ghosts for the most part of games and then he pops up and scores a goal and then on the one hand you're like this guy has not done enough and on the other you're like well he scored today. Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang for me as good as he's been this season as clinical as he's been he needs to improve in that area he needs to offer more to the team um, off the ball and at the moment it's not quite happening. So to wrap up my thoughts on uh, that damaging defeat in the the uh, situation it leaves us in now is, you know, Emery got it wrong from the start. And I've been very, uh, what's the word, negative about Emery in the past. I've praised him in the last couple of months. I think I said on the Napoli show that he's been as close to flawless as he could have possibly been over this last couple of months. So for that, he deserves immense credit. But yesterday, he got it completely and utterly wrong. And it's only fair that we point that out. Um, I think that the hair bear bunch in the middle of the park are not good enough. Um, That is clear for everyone to see. And I can't believe that at this stage of the season, a manager will put his faith in those two, especially after the performance that they put in at Everton, where I believe that they were the main reason for us failing to get ourselves together, to get any rhythm going, to to create anything. So I was very surprised to see him make that selection again. Um, Yes, the circumstances weren't great, but there were still other options. And so for me, that's not forgivable. Shkoran Mustafi was fucking awful, for wanting of a better term. Um, and he needs to pick himself up and go again because I have no doubt that Unai Emery will be using him for the remainder of the season. So he really needs to fix up. Um, I think that the performance 
from everybody in the first half was poor. It wasn't good enough. With the exception of maybe Bern Leno, who made a fantastic double save uh, in the first half. Everybody else was not at the races. And so we shouldn't have been in the position where we were chasing the game. And then we ended up getting exposed on the break. It's not good enough. Um, very, very disappointing afternoon. Spoiled most people's Easter's, unfortunately. Um, but in terms of where we are for the top four race, look, it's still in our hands. Let's not go into complete and utter meltdown about it. It's still in our hands. We've got some very difficult games coming up. Wolves, of course, on Wednesday um, and then Leicester next weekend. Uh, so there are some very, very difficult games to come. And, you know, it's not going to be easy if we do make it great. It'll be a good achievement. But if we don't make it, we'll be looking back at this Crystal Palace game and certain other games this season where Unai Emery has got his tactics wrong and individual errors have cost us. And, it, you know, people talk about it being a miracle for Arsenal finishing the top four. It's not a miracle for me because if Arsenal had got things right, certain moments in the season where bad decisions have cost us, we'd be comfortable now. We'd have qualified for the Champions League ages ago and, and we'd be fully focused on the Europa League, looking to win our first European trophy in, in many years and, and going on and, and, you know, really focusing on that. Now we've got a problem. We're in a catch-22 We've got this issue where we, the games are coming thick and fast. We don't know which route is the best to go down. The manager doesn't know which route is the safest to go down. Um, you know, at the end of the day, one game in Baku, it, assuming we get to the final, could be, you know, the make or break for Unai Emery's future at Arsenal. Will we get funds in the summer? I don't think so. I think we'll get some. I don't think we'll get enough to completely overhaul this squad. So for me... We need to find a way of getting the maximum out of what we have. And at the moment, I don't believe Unai Emery is doing that. Um, I think he's been great over the last couple of months. But yesterday showed examples of him having faith in, in certain players who just ain't ready, who aren't good enough. Um, his tinkering cost us yesterday. And that's not to say, oh, I want Unai Emery out or, you know, this and that. Because I know that's what's going to happen as soon as I release this. I'm going to get a load of tweets and stuff saying you know oh, you're so negative you want him out that's not the case I just want him to improve and I think he needs to improve if Arsenal are going to make the Champions League and Arsenal are going to qualify um, for the Europa League final and perhaps even go on and win it I think it's very very important now I'm going to look at some of your questions and comments from social media let's take a look now right this first question comes in from at Marble Halls underscore TV on Twitter uh, he says, Emery got it wrong, but surely Mustafi has proven he lacks the mentality to be a top level defender. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Um, Emery got it wrong. He did. But surely Mustafi's proven he lacks the mentality to be a top level defender. I think that's clear. I think we've we've seen that uh, throughout his time at Arsenal, not just this season. We've seen it last season, too. Um so, yeah, I think you're absolutely right there, mate. Thank you for sending that in. Uh, this next one comes from at Mazaruni. He says, when Emery was faced with top class wingers, he opted to have the weakest midfield pairing. Was it part of a mystery master plan or is he clutching at straws? Um, that's an interesting one. It's an interesting way of looking at uh, the logic behind his team selection. Personally, I don't think there was any logic behind it. I think that Unai Emery was complacent. I think that he felt Crystal Palace at home was a winnable fixture despite, um, you know, picking an understrength side. And for me, he got it horribly wrong. I don't think it was a master plan. I think Unai Emery was complacent. He was arrogant. And we've seen that during other points of the season. You know, I think he was a little bit arrogant in the way he handled the Mesut Ozil situation earlier on uh, in the campaign where he kind of went down the route of we don't need this guy you know he's not performing at his best I'm not going to try and work out how to get the best out of him I'm just going to leave him out and there were games where we were desperately missing his quality and his ability to unlock defenses so I think there is a bit of an arrogance there on Unai Emery's part and I think he thought that Wolves is going to be a tougher game on Wednesday and I'm not saying that's going to be an easy game but he probably thought this was going to be a, a walk in the park and that Palace would come here with nothing to play for and completely roll over. Well, wake up, mate. It's the Premier League. That doesn't happen here. That simply doesn't happen. You cannot go into games and and just, you know, assume that you're going to win them and pick under strength sides, um, whether it's for rotational reasons or fitness reasons or not, and think that you're going to get away with it. Um, this next one comes from Richard Wright on Twitter. He says, we're going to have to rotate again. Is it too much of a risk to try a youth with a vet player or even Licksteiner until the end of the season? 
I fear for injuries. Like I said already uh, um, on the show, I think that Shkodran Mustafi will retain his place in the Arsenal team. I don't think he'll be dropped. I think he'll still be a huge part of Unai Emery's plans between now and the end of the season. And I think whilst he's made some horrible errors that have cost us, he has had some good games, as I've already mentioned. Um, not enough of them. And it's not an excuse to, to cover up the, the shit show performances like yesterday. But I don't think Unai Emery trusts in Stefan Lichsteiner. I think that's why... Uh, we've seen him sort of fade away from the selection process of late. Um, and, uh, you know, for me, this might be controversial, but I'd still play Mustafi over Mavrobanos because he, the guy's completely unproven. He's a kid, he's rash, he's raw. Um, and I think the the Socrates suspension has really hurt us, really, really hurt us. Um, and, you know, thank God he'll be back on Wednesday and fingers crossed we can get back to the rhythm that we started to build because defensively we were doing okay. Um, we were starting to build some momentum. We were starting to uh, tighten up and, and you know, having players missing doesn't help, of course. Um, but for me, I don't think you'll see Stefan Lichsteiner get back in the side. I think that Mustafi will retain his place. I think Socrates will come in uh, on Wednesday night, probably alongside Koscielny and uh, maybe Nacho Monreal back at centre-back. Right, that brings me to the end of another review show. My thanks to all of you for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, hit like, hit subscribe. If you haven't already, share the video to your Guna friends. If you're listening via the audio, don't forget to subscribe. And if it's on iTunes in particular that you're listening from, don't forget to leave us a review. Those are really, really important. Of course, you can follow us on Twitter at Chronicles underscore AFC. And you can follow me on Twitter at Harry Simiu. If you've got any uh, comments or thoughts on the show and you're not on YouTube, you can tweet us directly as well. Um, and of course, we try and respond to all of those. So thank you once again for listening. I hope you guys enjoy what's left of your bank holiday weekend. And we'll be back on Thursday morning with a review of the uh, Wolverhampton Wanderers game. Might squeeze a cheeky uh, podcast, bonus podcast or video in between there somewhere if I get the time. Uh, but if not, I'll see you guys on Thursday. Take care.